So some final thoughts before we take uh, questions um, on unit analysis is basically define your units carefully. You know, there is no single unit, depending on which business you're in, you need to think about your units very carefully. The second message is triangulate, right? You know, you look at the business from the business model from the perspective of multiple units to, to see if it is profitable, if it's attractive from these multiple perspectives. Understand the hierarchy of units. So for example, for a restaurant chain, the most basic uh, unit is a meal. If the, if the restaurant chain is not making money on a meal, it is unlikely that it can make money on a customer or on an outlet, right? So really important to, to make sure that the meal is profitable. for you. The next uh, unit that they may want to look at is a customer. And finally, a typical outlet, right? A standardized outlet. Make your assumptions uh, explicit and test them with uh, small scale experiments. There are some excellent articles on this. I can share them with you. They are freely available online. There's an article by uh, Rita McGrath. I'll, ri I'll write it in the uh, chat. <clears throat> you can download the, uh, the PDF uh, freely. So it's called Discovery Driven Planning. It is written by, it's a bestseller, a Harvard Business Review bestseller um, by Rita McGrath and Ian McMillan. Um, and I strongly advise you to read this article. Um, it basically gives you insights on how to think about planning when you are faced with a very, very uncertain situation, right? Uh, where you are not sure about your assumptions. It's still okay for you to proceed with the, with, the, with the business, but you make your assumptions explicit and you define specific milestones where you test your assumptions. And once you get you know, data uh, on whether those assumptions are valid or not, you, you modify your plans accordingly, right? And consider a dynamic scenario, right? So for example, if you're in the restaurant business, your rental costs may go up over time. Your labor costs may go up over time. So for example, e-commerce businesses may find that there is a, a, a wage inflation for, for delivery personnel, right? Uh, that uh, that they have to they have to factor in. So think about dynamic scenarios. Nothing is static. You know, um, the competitors take action. So you may need to you may need to bring down your prices or your costs may keep going up. So consider uh, dynamic scenarios as you move forward. So that was just uh, an overview of unit economics. Uh, I hope that was useful. And um, now I'm happy to take uh, questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for that insightful talk. Um, we'll now open the session for questions. Oh, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, this is um, this is Venkatesh from IM Bangalore. Um, so first of all, great talk, sir. So I think uh, sort of you laid out the uh, setup very nicely and also brought in the difference between healthy and not so healthy uh, unit economics. The question really is, how do we know? And, and I think you mentioned a lot of examples which seem more like an exposed set of examples. So while the entrepreneur is going through the journey early on, um, so is there anything in terms from the unit economics where you might consider in certain kinds of uh, sectors or certain kinds of markets um, the unit economics is uh, can never be healthy uh, the way it looks like, or is there any, uh, I mean, again, I don't know much about the research in this area, but it'd be great to hear your thoughts on how do entrepreneurs do it while the event is going on, where, as opposed to looking at exposed yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think we've met, you You are a finance professor. Yes, right? yeah, 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 yeah we, we did. Yeah. Yeah, when I Thank was on sabbatical, yeah, 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 I remember you very well. So thanks for your question. I think that's an excellent question. So as I admitted, you know, for researchers, it's very, very difficult to get hold of good data. Uh, but these data are available to the entrepreneurs. And if it's a venture-backed company, they are available to investors, correct? 
So it's really incumbent upon the entrepreneurs and investors to spend some time uh, thinking about how much they are spending on acquiring customers, how much they are, you know, how long the customers are staying with them. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of a, of a company of which I'm a customer. It's actually a subscription-based company. And um, uh, the, the founders know very well that um, after uh, two or three years of operations, that the renewal rate is about 40%, right? So they're losing about 60% of the customers every year, right? So this kind of information is usually available to entrepreneurs. Um, when it comes to customer acquisition costs, they may need to estimate those, right? You know, given how much they're spending maybe on Google ads or other social media marketing uh, campaigns, um, they may need to estimate those, but having a, a decent estimate is better than not having anything, right? You don't have to be very exact about this, but uh, the insiders, uh, the entrepreneurs and the investors do have access to very fi fine grained data and they should be looking at it very closely uh, in order to make their uh, in order to make their decisions but uh, you, as you rightly pointed out for outsiders like us it's much more difficult okay and um, even when uh, companies agree to me writing cases about them they are usually very wary about sharing these data uh, so for example in the article we speak about an excellent company that i have been tracking for many years it's called Nephroplus. It's the largest uh, kidney dialysis chain in India. And uh, I, I've interacted many times with the lead founder, CEO, Vikram Bukpala. Uh, they've raised, uh, I think, close to $100 million in uh, venture capital funding and debt. Um, and I have a very good relationship with him, right? But, uh, but you know, for example, I wanted to, to use uh, that company's example in the article. And, you know, he said his, uh, his investors have uh, not approved that, right? Okay. So it's, it's a very sensitive topic in uh, private companies. And yeah, actually, sir, we, the data is not an issue. In fact, we, uh, as a part of the incubator, we do have access to a lot of these startups uh, inside information. The only problem, as you saw, for example, in the retention rate for Luckin that you showed, I mean, the retention rate actually starts dropping initially and then it picks up. So the question is, how do we know it will pick up? I think, of course, the entrepreneurs are always optimistic. Um, and um, is there a sort of, you know, uh, ways in which you can figure out in where it will pick up and where it will never pick up? Sort so of I think uh, the, the only way to do it is by trial and error. Correct. So, so uh, the reason I, I'm assuming that when Luckin Coffee saw that out of 100 who had bought in February, uh, only 38 bought in March, they probably introduced a promotional campaign to, to, to get that back up. Correct. And entrepreneurs hmm. have to do this all the time. You know, they have to I continuously okay. keep doing, you know, uh, applying trial and error techniques to, to do this. And, um, so, for example, with this company that I mentioned, uh, I'm a customer of, they are trying to come up with uh, uh, new products that customers may, may like and that might make customers more sticky to the business. So, it's, it's a constant process of experimentation. Okay. It's basically Thank a trial error, yeah. More questions? Are there any questions uh, in chat? Yes, sir. We, so we have a question from Mubarak who's, who asks, how can we improve the unit economics? Yeah, so basically the, the, the improving unit economics is, is, you know, very, very straightforward, right? Uh, you know, on a, for example, on a, on, if you take the, the, let's take the coffee example, right? If you can increase your prices and, and reduce your costs, you know definitely you're going to improve the unit economics there. If you can improve the retention rate from 32% to 50%, right? You are increasing the lifetime value of the customer tremendously. If you can improve the monthly spend from 49 RMB to 60 RMB, that's a huge improvement in your unit economics. Right. If you can, which is which is happening with Luckin Coffee, if you can keep reducing your 
customer acquisition costs because your brand is, is more and more known, that's going to improve your unit economics. So, so the, the, these levers actually, you know, once you start doing this analysis, the levers for improving the unit economics become very obvious. Thank you for that answer, sir. Uh, another question from R.C. Nair. Uh, he asks um, that you mentioned a healthy ratio of CLV CAC ratio of three to one. Should a startup focus on this ratio when they start or should they take a skewed ratio to begin with, focusing more on CAC and then marginally increase the ratio? So as an unknown brand, a startup faces higher CAC. Uh, yeah, yes, so that I think that's a realistic way to look at it. Uh, but definitely you want to be looking at ways to reduce the CSE, right? And, uh, you know, improving the, the CLV. Um, yeah, take a dynamic view and nothing is, I mean, uh, things will not be ideal to begin with, right? Uh, initially, it's a struggle to get the venture off the ground. Nobody knows you. You don't have a, you don't have a history. Um, you, very often, you don't have a product when you go to the market to, sh to show the market. You don't have satisfied customers whose testimonials you can use. Uh, so, and you don't sometimes have a, have a, a, you know, a team that you can use to impress your prospective customers. So you very often are starting off at a, at a very disadvantageous situation. And you may be making your initial transactions uh, based on that disadvantage, right? But uh, you want that to gradually improve over time. For example, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, just to, just to market my own my own school. Uh, we are a new school of management, and last year we started our admissions campaign in April, in the midst of the second wave, and we struggled like anything. I mean, we had to work extra hard to get applications in, but in just one year, we are finding in 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 year two as we go to the market that the admissions uh, applications flow has improved tremendously. And uh, there is a you know considerable word of mouth uh, publicity, uh, so um, so so things improve over time if you do if you focus on the on the right things. Right? If you focus on quality, if you focus on customer satisfaction, if you focus on you know there's this concept called product market fit, right? <clears throat> if you make sure that your offering is is you know tightly uh, aligned to what the customers are looking for then uh, yes you know there's a there's a webinar that i did that many of you may be interested in watching it's it's available on youtube it's called product market fit and uh, the speaker was paul asel who's one of the most experienced investors in the world he's based in silicon valley but he also has deep knowledge of china and india he's made several investments in india also and i think he has invested in something like four unicorns on it. his his company it's called nokia growth partners uh, they've invested in about four unicorns. So you may want to watch that uh, webinar. It's called the Product Market Fit. Paul Asel, A-S-E-L. Thank you, sir. We'll, we'll definitely watch that uh, webinar. Uh, another question we have from Rajesh. He asks, how is CAC calculated when you're acquiring customer through direct selling without, and without making any marketing expenditure? External marketing expenditure. Yeah, so a very good question. Excellent question and very relevant for B2B businesses, right? Uh, so I think um, I'm just, uh, you know, I've been in B2B businesses before. So here you may want to look at uh, the sales person's salaries, okay? So if, for example, you know, if you are, um, um, if, if your uh, sales person is costing you, let's say, uh, one and a half lakh per month, and you are incurring um, additional costs on travel and accommodation and so on. And the cost and the uh, and the hit rate of the salesperson is let's say uh, one customer for every ten sales visits, right? Or or you know, then you can you can get an idea of how many sales visits that that salesperson is making in a month. Uh, and how many, uh, how many customers that salesperson is bringing in, right? And what is the cost of that salesperson during that month? So that will give you a, a decent idea of the customer acquisition cost, plus any other associated costs that you are incurring beyond the salesperson's salary and, and uh, 
travel and accommodation expenses. Telephone, telephone bills obviously need to be factored in, right? But uh, in B two B businesses, uh, you know the the selling costs are very very important, and I think if you get a good handle of those, you should have a good idea of the customer acquisition costs. Okay, sir. Thank you. I think uh, we'll take one more question uh, in the interest of time. Um, so Parthivan asks, how do we judge, predict the percentage of customers who would re repeat uh, in case the product has lifetime of more than two to three years? I think um, there are, you know, the, the easy answer is, is basically to say that you you wait until the end of the product life cycle to see if they're repeating. That is the easy answer. But I think one way to, um, to track it that marketers use is this famous net promoter score. The net promoter score calculates, it's actually a very scientific uh, approach to uh, measuring customer satisfaction. Uh, and uh, it, it gives you an idea of how delighted customers are with your service. Okay, so I think if I'm not mistaken, Arushi, you're probably uh, very much uh, aware of the calculation. I think those who, on a scale of one to 10, uh, it is what, those who, those who rate you nine and 10, correct? Those who rate you nine and 10, minus those who rate you seven or below, right? So, so that is the, uh, the percentage of customers who are saying, nine and 10 minus the customers who are saying seven or below uh, will give you your net promotion promoter score. You can easily look it up on the, on the web, but that is a good indicator. Five and below. Five and below, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so that will give you a very good idea of what is the level of customer satisfaction with your product or so with your offering. Uh, 